Okay. All right. So good morning to you all. Uh, welcome to the last day of our session. I am hopeful that we would have some good reasons for for coming. So yesterday we had some assignment for ourselves. Does anybody want to share with us the results of your assignment? If anybody want to share with us. How many of us were able to do it? Let me see. Let me see if you were able to do it, if you were able to plan something, if you're able to write something. Laurentia. Hello, Henry. Good morning. I, I hope you're fine. I was actually trying to uh, type in the chat. I know as you I am. But so okay, so but I could I could still um mention it if, if that would be okay. The noise wouldn't be that bad. Fine. We just want to to see what's what people did. Um, it will help us to all you know at least reflect on what we did yesterday. So if you can share, that's fine. Yes, please. So yesterday, um, with regards to the question one and two. I mentioned that um, we actually set up prizes looking at um, what our other competitors are doing and to set up prizes. And then we also look at um, um, what customers are willing to pay. Um, and well, yes, I actually got a, a better understanding of willingness to pay by customers. So it has given me a, a, a varied um, um, understanding of it now. Um, with the, regards to the last one, with, um, the knowledge I've gained from yesterday's session, I would want to implement the um, three three um, um, pricing methods. First, I would apply the cell select um, cell select uh, pricing method. So, um, with our products. We use baobab oil and um, other essential oils to make our products. And they, these have medicinal and then um, um, uh, cosmetic um, effect, medicinal effect on the skin, which is very good. But sometimes you have um, customers coming in to tell you that they wish they had another or a combination of different um, um, elements, organic elements in there. So some, some people will say, can I get oil, um, carrot oil in there? Or can I get turmeric? So with this self select, I'm looking at pricing it a, a bit higher than the normal one or the general um, product that we make so that th that pricing will be different from the normal one and higher. The other um, pricing uh, method I'm looking at is the, the um, consumer um, the classification. Sorry, customer customer classification. So with the customer classification, we we are looking to serve a varied um, um, group of people. We are looking at we we know um, the uh, the number of people that go to school, the, the second cycle institutions and then the tertiary institutions are high. So if you are able to buy into them getting to know the product, using it whilst they are in school, and then making it more like a culture where they wouldn't be able to live without it. And it's so that in future, they will still recommend it to their families and then uh, more like a transitioning um, from just from them to other people in their families. So we um, we are looking at implementing the customer classification, which we look at uh, people in schools, people that are being taken care of um, by other older uh, generations. 
and then the other classification will be people that are buying their own products and that are using. So with these people, we we have um, we'll do more like a, um, somebody that can afford for themselves, buy for themselves. And I'm not making sense. <laughs> And then the, the and this effect. So uh, there are people that are looking at organic products made from um, potash. So um, these are soaps, um, cleansers, facial cleansers, uh, um, shampoos for their hair. So if we are able to put these together for them, it would do a good thing for it. It would be a good thing for them because. They will get it will be like a one stop shop where they get all the necessary things for their cosmetics to take care of their skin mm. and then their hairs. Mm. So that's what we are looking at with the bundling. And again, looking at the second cycle institution of the students, we also want to do a bundling for them. Okay. Like you mentioned yesterday, we could buy other products that are not related to our products or something that they could use after our products. Mm -hmm. So if we are selling soap, and this is actually meant for to, uh, for scrubbing and then bathing. Then we actually look at adding certain things like sponge. I realized that sponge was something that normally people uh, they would go and buy it and then they or something like that. Mato semina become a sponge. So if we put it all together for them as students, it would be something that they would love to buy or have uh, love to have. In, in, in their school um, pack. So these are the three things that I hope to implement with my business. Thank you. That's good. Just as you were talking, um, one of the things that you can think about in, in the strategic planning, there's something we call, or, or maybe investment planning, that we call backward integration. So there are actually three levels. There's a backward integration, there's a, there's a horizontal integration, um, and then there's a forward integration. So what it means is that um, if you were looking at investing in your raw material, um, we mentioned yesterday that these Asians will come, they go to the up north, they will invest in the raw, raw material. They're just doing backward integration so that they have access more than even the entire market itself. And sometimes too, you can even invest in your supply, especially when you notice that that, that also takes lots more money from you. You can also do that. But horizontally, there are some complementary products that you can also, also invest in. So maybe um, look at someone who's making production in those areas and say, well, do you need a partner? Do you need um, an investor? Do you need something like that? And then you can also invest some of these things, uh, some of your, your profit in those areas. It helps to diversify your portfolio. So um, you can think about those things as well. I guess it will, it will be helpful. Thank you. Anyone else? Let's take one or two more and then continue. Anyone else? Welcome. Anyone else? Today I see I see Constance. Oh, it's not my it's not the Constance I know. Okay. Um today is the last day. If you if you don't talk, it means I will never hear your voice. <laughs> so so when you have to call or something, it will be difficult for me to identify your voice. So please talk. Let's hear you. And again, like I said, some of these things as you share, it's you begin to think about things that you never thought about. So please try and let's share. Let's share what we have decided to do. All right. Since no one is ready to share um, yet, okay, no problem. 
since since nobody's willing to share yet, I guess we can continue. Um, but before then, anyone has any questions from what we did yesterday? Yesterday we dedicated a bunch of everything. Yeah, I think content network. She's having issues with her mic. Yes, I just saw that message. I just saw. Yes. Yeah, so if if you have a question, um, there's a time to ask. Otherwise, then we jump into a new phase. All right. It's I believe ten. 14, 10, 15. Okay, so let's move. So we have got into the final bit of it. Today we're going to look at budgeting and financial reports. Um, and I just wanted to start off with these three key points. That a practical knowledge of finance and accounting is an an indispensable part of any manager's toolkit. If you are a manager, then you would need to know that you cannot you cannot say that you don't know accounting, you don't know finance, because that's that's basically what your business is about. Even if you are doing a social um, you are a social organization, you still get people to donate for you to do what you're doing. If you are whether you are a philanthropist or whatever it is that you still use money as an input and money still come back as an output. Maybe the way you treat it is not as those who are doing profit. And so your main objective will not be to measure how much to get those impacts. You still need money to make those impacts. So you have, you have to understand how money works in the organization that you are running. So everybody, once you choose to run a business or to manage a business, you should be interested in how to manage money or what money is about. Count the first day we, we try we try to differentiate between accounting and finance. You should be able to understand all these two key points: what accounting are, what what it means to your organization, and what finance is, and what it means to your organization. With, with well-developed financial skills, you can understand how your actions impact organization, impact your organization, um, and, and, and then it help you to make proper decisions. So yesterday, one of the things that's, and I think from the first day, one of the things we kept on saying is that your customer side is very important for you to understand. But we also mentioned that if you are putting up a building, the most critical part of the building is the foundation. And when you look at the BMC, the BMC, the, the entire foundation of the BMC is finance. The left side, you have your cost. The right side, you have your revenue. And you need to understand how to start. If the foundation is weak, then you now you know what's going to happen. Once the foundation is weak, um, you're not going to have a going concern. You're just going to work, and it will not be a business that you can say you are nurturing into the future. So we will touch on two or three. I mentioned yesterday that we will look at two mainly, but if you have time, we'll touch on the last one. Um, we have about five different areas I would have liked but like I said, it's a crash program. And if you feel that some of the things you are, especially with the, with the accounting part or maybe with the finance part, um, it looks like you are in a classroom, it is because you have to be. Because this is very important for you as a business owner or as an entrepreneur um, or even as a self-employed. You need to be able to understand how this play. Otherwise, then it becomes a venture that is going nowhere. Okay, so just as we've kept on saying today, we look at budgeting, we look at why we need to budget, we look at some of the budget essentials. If you have some time, we'll try and ask. I am praying that you will talk so that you give us examples of how your income and expenditure lines look like in your organization. And then we will use that as a, as a, a text scenario to create 
a budget or to create a financial report and see how that will help. I'm not, you know, these are things that you study them for a long, long time. Um, people go to school to study accounting for years and people go to school to study finance for years. And so it is very important that we understand, we know that this program will not necessarily teach you accounting or finance in its details. Um, when I was doing my undergrad, it took me, what, four years to do accounting and finance. Um, at Harvard, it took, just, just doing balance sheet took me about six weeks to study, how, to study balance sheets and some other things that goes into it. So this program is not something that this you know, three hour program is going to be a time that we can fully delve into this report. But what we're trying to do is that so long as you are in charge of what you are doing, you should be able to understand when you see a report and be able to know what it means. What are some of the pointers that you must understand? You should be able to read it, basically. Yesterday, I mentioned that two people that I respect when it comes to their understanding of finance, one an African, one an American, um, Strive Matiwa and Warren Buffett, both of them agree on one principle, that if you want to be in business, you cannot afford not to understand finance or accounting. It's very important that you understand it. Because if you don't, then basically you are just um, setting yourself up to fail. So we look at the financial reports, we try and then um, I'll speak through them mostly, and then we'll try and see if you can get a case study. If you, if you talk and then you give us some scenarios, we can create a few budget, um, sorry, a few balance sheet, income statement, cash flow from it, um, and then see how that goes. And one time we'll go into the ROI analysis. I mentioned that there's the anticipated, there's actual, what that means, what it um, I, what I mean to have an actual ROI. We'll look at what it means to have a positive or negative ROI. Um, and then we'll look at the calculation of the return of, on investment. So again, just to give you an overview of what I hope today we will catch importance of budgets, why you should have it, how to prepare the budget, um, some of the components basically. Not necessarily the entire thing. Um, so the components that you, the income statements. And because I, I know a few of us here um, are doing, um, I'm not sure, I, I didn't really do a lot more with, with people in terms of their reporting. But here in the States, there's a, there's a report we call functional income and expense. It basically classifies and, and so, the understanding of running a social enterprise is that you are running them on programs, on activities. So the activity, each activity must be able to tell you how much it is bringing and how much it is taking. And how much it's bringing can just be the donation that you get for that particular activity. Sometimes you get... Um, but you should be able to know which activity takes more money and which does not. And so we, we prepare for the financial income and expenses for, for those ones. Why you cannot look at cash flow in isolation. Uh, um, and then possibly we can look at the annual report um, if we had some time. And like I said, if there's time, we'll look at the return on investment. Good, so let's start. When you hear budgeting or we hear budget, okay, first, let me ask this. How many of us have prepared our 2024 budget for our, our builders? Let me see, just, just show by hands. I want to know this one, this one is a yes. If you didn't show your hand, you say you haven't done it. 
So let me see how many have prepared budget for your organization for 2024. Hey, we are here. Marisha, your hand is it going down? It's going up. It's down. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Henry. Hi. Yeah, this is Constance. Oh, because yeah, I'm so... using my laptop, it's it's coming up as Tansy. Yes. Yeah, so I still see. me. Yeah. I did my assignment. So when when we have time, then we do the presentation. Okay. We just you just missed the beginning. So maybe when we get to, when we get to the end, we can still get some, some time to do that. Um but the question is, have you present have you prepared your budget for this year? Anybody? I'm on it. <laughs> hey, so today is 17, today is 17 right? 18th. Yeah. What have you been spending and what have you been earning? <laughs> well, they are all in the record. <laughs> But what are you benchmarking it with? You should you budget is a that is in my head, you know, that's very bad. But after this course, <laughs> I will repent in ashes and sackcloth. I tell you, you I get me, somebody to do it. <laughs> you remind me of, of several years ago when I was in a bank. I there was these guys who came to open a, a, an account, and they they when they came, we asked them to bring a resolution to open the account. And we asked the secretary, he said he doesn't know how to write. <laughs> so we asked her, oh. so how then do you take money? He says, oh, I'm going to meet you now. I'm going to meet you. meet you. Actually, we use more projections than budgeting. But what, you, you should write them. It, it's the same thing. It's just an estimate. You are, you are, you are just, projections are budget. It's the same thing. Okay, budget all right. Budget you anticipate okay. Okay. to spend. Yeah, so you just okay. have to, write them that's what i'm just saying so when you write you know where you want to end where you want to spend so that and and, and as we go into it we'll talk about it so for instance that one I'm is sure. not in my head the projections are all on paper yeah okay. but since you say it's the same as budgeting after this session i'm going to look at it in a different way okay and when with the knowledge that i get maybe tweak it and then make it a bit more professional Awesome, awesome. So you, I'm sure you've heard Parliament talk about appropriation, or you've ever heard appropriation bill. It is a I bill that is, that is that is passed every year after budget, yeah. and organizations have the same. One problem that people have with budgeting is that some people, sometimes they write the thing but they don't follow it, and and that is the problem of appropriation, and so. Um, as we are talking about how to plan, you also have to know that planning and not using it is also as guilty as if you don't plan. All right. So as we say, an important financial skill every entrepreneur or business manager must understand and master is the cycle of budgeting. And that is the ability of to prepare and oversee a financial plan that estimates income and expenses over a, def a defined period. So what that means is that you can even, you can budget and break down your budget into weeks, into months, into quarterly, but you should have a way that you can benchmark and check and see whether, well, I anticipated to earn 100,000 um, cities within the first quarter. How did I anticipate that? I, I expected that I would, you know, Looking at how my sales have been in the previous years, I have been getting, let's say, 80,000. Now I want to have an aggression. I want to have aggressive in, um, um, promotion. I want to expand the market. I want to go to places that I've not gone before. So I expect to get this. So it must be, it should be a justification for the number you put in there. And this is something that every entrepreneur or manager must know. So at a basic level, a budget helps you understand the resources that is needed to achieve your goal. It helps you to know how much do I need to spend what I am planning to spend. So it is very important that you take budgeting seriously. Budgeting is an essential management skill that helps 
drive organization success. With a clear understanding of your firm's processes and goals, budgeting is a well-developed plan for evaluating performance. So like I said, um, if you have written down maybe your goals and you say that to be the, 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 cos the cosmetic house um, of the nation by 20, say 30, and then you run that back in your strategic planning and say that, okay, so 2030 is just um, maybe just about how many years? We are in 2024, so six years, right? So run it down every year. What do I need to do to get to that level? That benchmarking can be done by something that you can actually quantify it. It is not just about writing and saying, I want to be there. What, what are the practicalities of them? It is very important that budget is, is always done. And sometimes people actually budget for five years, break them down, and they revise them. You can actually revise your budget. You put a figures because you went to the market and then you, you, know, you did a plus or minus inflation and then you put in some numbers together. But as the days go by, you notice that mm, what you put there looks like it's not gonna be um, realistic. You need to evaluate, you need to have a time that you can evaluate your numbers so that at least you can check whether you need to revise or keep to the same numbers. So you need a basic knowledge of financial principles to help you develop a budget for an informed decision Ensure your team meets its targets. So why do we budget? Why do we why do we even need to worry ourselves to think about budgeting, putting together figures? I do that just go. I mean, when they buy, I know what I want to spend with. Well, one thing that um somebody said to me that has always you know stuck with me is that when you don't have a plan. Once money comes into your hand, ideas come into your head. So think that you didn't that's think. true. <laughs> that's <laughs> very true. Because you can get a huge sum and then you wouldn't know what you've done with it. Yes. By the time you realize that's finished and you've not accomplished half of what you wanted to do. Yes. That's how money is. If you don't have a plan, once money comes into your hand, ideas begin to rush into your head. That is when you begin to feel that, hey, you say, I say, Sajin Kra, meet me at Tommy and Sakra, at the DKNK. You know, um, and that's, when, <laughs> that's when you begin to know that the trust Kikra wasn't even good. No, you go Uber. <laughs> uh, but you had not budgeted for Uber until you made a good sale and you started getting good revenue. You said, no. It's kind of bouncing my mind. Now you want to spend it, you know, and that is very dangerous. And that is because we don't have, when we don't have plans, um, you know, written down, we get some into some of these challenges. So why do we budget? Why do we budget? The first thing is that when you budget, you can communicate expectations and goals clearer to stakeholders. So without budget, any business, you know, wound up with no clear expectation. You can give guessworks and some figures, arbitrary figures, you know, but budgets, even though they are estimates, they are estimate based on some form of research. So if you put there and say that, if you, if you are budgeting for rent, you want to ask or check how much rent is before you budget. And that's very important for us. Also. So you can communicate, you can tell someone, well, we expect that our rent will go high by say 20% this year. Why? Because um, maybe we are trying to get additional office and that is why we expect it to go. So you have justification for every number. And one thing about budget is that you don't just put the figures there. Every figure must be supported by a reason. It must be similar to your 
objective, the objective of the organization for the year, for the quarter, for the month. So basically, those things that you scribble down or you plan, you are just having numbers to it. So I remember I told you that in this, the fullness of this program has one part that we do a BMC analysis. And so on all the nine areas, you put value there. So you are basically putting the width of your business model canvas. It's not part of this program because, because, because of the time, but once we're able to do that, you know what is the width of your customer or of your channel of distribution or what is the value of your costs, of your revenue? What is the value of your um, key partners? So, so it's very important that we put together a budget. And the second reason why we put together a budget is that you help you to fully understand the resources needed to achieve your goal. The estimate is the monetary version of everything that must go on in your business. If you don't have an idea what this is, you have already missed the goal before starting. And, and usually in such situations, you are, <laughs> you are motivated by forces. So just like, like we just said that, then ideas begin to come into your head. Some people just come there, they pitch you something, you just go ahead and then you just buy it because you, there's no plan for it. Once you become a business person, an entrepreneur, a self-employed person, the, one of your strengths should be that you should be able to plan. Because once you are not able to plan, then you get frustrated quickly. And if you, you can get duped very easily. Because usually when you begin to get excited about sales one day, you notice that people just come to you and then all the money will be gone. So planning should be part of you. And the best form of planning is planning your numbers. It also gives you a standard of assessment. It helps you to know whether you are achieving your objective or not whether you are a for-profit or a non-profit, money is the foundation of your business model. And you will not want it to be something that um, it just passes, uh, something that you don't understand. Budget is a way to assess your progress. It will give you insight into your organization's financial health. With your estimates and its components, you can est estimate the financial pattern and understand what you have and what you do not have. Help you to know what do you have, what don't you have, what do you need, what don't you need. Who do you need those things from? And then finally, it is a strategic resource allocation. This is a component of investment. With your estimated receivables and payables, you will be able to plan and prioritize important activities. So budgets guide your appropriation of funds, how you spend your funds, and help plan your capital backs. So um, I remember, I think on the first day, um, constantly use the word bootstrapping. If you plan that, I remember what we used to, when we used to run more uh, incubation program, I used to tell the, the entrepreneurs that one thing that I observed about most of us, especially um, in our ecosystem, not only in Ghana, in fact, almost on the entire continent, is that we want to <laughs> move straight from our, our mission and appear in our vision. So the person put together a business plan. They have an expectation of how the business should be, how big it should be. They are waiting to get money to start it like that. 
So you you have a vision. And where you are, the reason you are starting, the mission, you want to just, once you disappear from your mission, you have to appear in your vision. It doesn't work that way. It takes work. It takes your core values. The core values are your vehicle to take you to your vision. And so you that's why we have planning. We plan for five years, we plan for 10 years, because you know you need to take some processes to lead you there. Otherwise, then um the business will not get to where it has to be. When you look at most of the business that are that are making waves today, when they started, nobody thought they would get there. Amazon, think about it. Nobody thought about it at all. So that's how it is for budget as well. Please, any questions about why we budget? Any questions? All right. Silence means concern. I'm only hoping that you are with me. Okay, so we're gonna move into another phase. We will not do the exercise yet. When we finish with the other phase, then we'll try and see. If anybody is willing to give us numbers, we'll, we'll go into Excel and then proceed to prepare budget for you. All right. What happened? Okay, looks like some of my slides are not coming. The budget essentials are not coming. All right, so I don't know if you are right, and if you are, then I could, there are some key things that you need to do when you are budgeting. So, I could say them, then you can put them down. And I'm sure once it has been recorded, we can also get those later. But the first thing, the essential thing that we need to do when we're budgeting is that we must have timelines and procedure. Usually large organizations will have budget ready by October or and then get it approved by, by December. That's why I ask you how many of us have our 2024 budget. If you are already started spending and you don't have the, the the estimate for them, then it means that you are spending out of just, you are spending as they come. And that is very dangerous. So having a timeline and procedures for budget at the beginning is very important to start well. If you are a new business, you are only putting estimates or fair market value on your activities and operation. You need to know when your deliverables are due and ensure you effectively manage your time and connect with stakeholders who can inform your allocation decision. So number one, the first essential thing that you need is to have budget timelines. When must your budget be ready? And procedures, how do you do that? Um, as I sit here, I am to prepare a budget for one organization. And uh, I, I need to do a lot more work because we started doing the bookkeeping for just one year. Um, they don't, so they don't, they don't really understand most of the things that they, they want. So you need to tell them the, the danger that they are putting themselves in. And here, if you don't file your taxes, your business is already dead. Everything is done with your social security. So if you don't have it, then it means that you cannot even work for somebody. We take your money from you without you know it. Second thing is that you need historical financial figures as input data. That is why financial reporting is very important. And if you are a startup, you can look at similar organizations 
uh, maybe you can check some organization or again these are estimates so all the line items that you are budgeting for you may then have to ask what the prices are and if you want to run a budget for let's say a year you can look at the historical pricing of those items and see the margin of increase during the year so assuming that you are you are budgeting for say rent and then now um one office room that you're using is say going for let's say 2500 ghana cities but you realize that two years ago this thing was 1005 last year it was 2000 2500 it should tell you that there has been there is a cumulative margin increase so you cannot plan and put 2500 ghana cities there you need to add something based on the trend so you need historical financial figures as input data for your budget. The third thing is that you must convert goals into numbers. What are the organization goals that you have? You need to convert those goals into numbers. Your budget is the financial reflection of your business strategy. A great budget captures the organizational goal into numbers. Before I send the slide, I'll try and and then insert these things. Um, I thought I had them somewhere. It looks like this one. So if you have a five-year strategic plan, you must build a five-year budget to support it. Everything about your business is money. For instance, if your firm is planning an organizational change, which will require it to redesign its website as part of the, as part of its process. Your team will be responsible for maybe writing web copies, you know, uh, putting together um, the content, creating videos, designing graphics. This will cost money. So you need to put some, some figures to it. With this requirement, you can then break down the, the specific amounts that will need to be set aside for maybe your expansion. And then the last, but one that you need, the essential thing that you need for your budget is that that it must be time sensitive. Your budget is not only a financial projection for your business. It also gives you a time card for delivery. This is why we prepare periodic budgets like weekly budget, monthly budget, quarterly budget, and annual budget. And sometimes you prepare five-year budget, 10 years budget. You know, as we go on, we begin to review them. I mean, I will, I would, I would say that if you have a 10-year budget, that would be great. Every year you begin to review them you know, to be sure that you are reaching somewhere and help you to know whether you are getting to your destination or not. So this is why we prepare those budgets. When you pick your budget, you should be able to understand the accounting and finance cycle of your business. And it's so important that budget help evaluate your performance. So just as you did the, the plan, to benchmark your performance, the business need a budget to evaluate the progress. It's a measure tool for your finances. Okay, any questions about budgets so that we draw the curtains here on budget? It, it appears once we start talking about numbers and calculation, people go, go mute. Hello. Yes. Yes. Yes, Henry. Please. Um, I wanted to know if um planning a budget, you would have to include all the elements of um production, and then.
We just lost administrative you. costs and all that. Going to do with this. My network here is really bad today. Please, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yes, I have your question. Whether so, the budget. You, need to, you need to plan everything, including transportation. Okay. If you are, if you anticipate that you are going to this year, do you think that okay? I want to treat my customers right. So every customer that comes to my place, like you mentioned, we want to just dash you one sponge. That has to be budgeted for. If you get someone like me to sit on your board, <laughs> if you don't have budget, you spend though. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to know, you know what this inflation affects so many things, especially um with always network. Using your learning share. Okay. So when I guess Transportation you Transportation costs. How, how? Okay. But I guess we understand that you, you're, you are asking how do you factor in inflation? Yes. Um, yes, please. Okay. So like I, like I, I, the example I gave, some, some of these things, you know, even though there's inflation in Ghana, it's not, it's not hyperinflation. Even if it's hyperinflation, there there are some trends that you can follow. So sometimes it's better that you give a high margin budget. So for instance, if you notice that in the past one year, there has been 30% rise in fuel prices, you can decide that you're going to make your budget with a 35% rise in your, your transportation per month. If it doesn't okay. come to that, if it doesn't come to that, fine. But if it comes to that, you're okay. But again, one other thing you also have to understand is that, I mean, budgets are projections. It's just like the same way as you can plan something about a business and then you have an engagement and you notice that, no, I want to revise my strategy. So that is why there's, there's something we call uh, amendment budget. You can amend your budget, you can bring an updated budget. So you can decide to say that, that's why, in the beginning, I mentioned that you should have certain timelines. You can see that every quarter we review our budget and okay. check to see whether we are spending within the budget or we are spending outside the budget. So do we need to okay. increase or decrease it? Sometimes you may have to even decrease it. So like I said, you see a pattern of 30% rise in, in fuel prices. But then at a point, you would notice that mm, um, prices have become dropping. Maybe the... Um, What's it called? The war has stopped. So Russia is pumping more. Ukraine is not, you know, all those things. And so the price is dropping. You can revise your budget down. Um, you have a line, depending on the system that you're operating, you can have a timeline for revision, budget revision. Okay. If there are no questions on budgets, it means that all of us now will have to prepare our budget. That's all. That's all right with me. Hello. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So everybody now can prepare a budget. So I'm sure that with this cohort after after here, everybody will have to present their budget for a review. Okay. Mm. So so they will send it um to me and then I can forward to you for a, a review. Yes. Right. If you need if you need us to do that, that's fine. We can spend some time to help you to develop a good budget. So this one, like I said, this is an open invitation. So okay. it would be good if you want to do it. Um, why not? We'll help you. 
I'm even here. We do volunteer work for people. You, you drive your own car, go to a place and go and train them. And then because somebody, I remember um, about three years ago, there was a lady, a young girl, I think it was in high school. Um, they put together, she said she, said she wants to, she want to be, she wants to go into music and she needed incubation. So for, for about two months or so, we we're always on the phone. We we're trying to help her to build a model. Uh, we're into the Aka. Right now, if she's some hit lady, I don't even know. Uh -huh. So please, for me, I, I am praying that those of us who are on the line will try and make use of this cohort. Come out with it, challenge yourself. If you have questions you need to ask, I'm sure Papa Space put this together so that we can help ourselves. As we have an internet problem, yeah. we, should, we should be thinking about how, what other means can we use to get stable access to communication? And maybe you'll be the next millionaire or billionaire. So please. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we'll advance to the next part of our session today, which is financial reporting. And you notice that we have four levels there. We will try and do them. And then um, when I'm done, we will try and see if we can go to Excel. That is if anybody is willing to give us figures, give us figures from your organization. You can you can give us just your, 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 your cost centers or your your line items that we can use and then we see if we can build an income statement for for you or a balance sheet for you or a cash flow statement for you all right so financial statement offers a window into the health of a company which can be difficult to gauge by other means when we don't understand we lose vital insights into our business so to understand a company's prospects and progress you need to review and analyze several financial statements, balance sheets, income statements, or financial income and expenses, cash flow statements, and then annual and quarterly reports. Sometimes we prepare some of these things on a monthly basis. One of the organizations that we, we prepare, we do their bookkeeping for them. We send them quarterly statements. And each quarter, we give you a trend and tell them what that means. Tell them what that means. Sometimes when they get a little more margin, they're excited, but we tell them what that means. Your growth is getting stagnant. So reviewing and understanding financial statements help you with valuable insight about organizations such as your business debt and ability to repay, your profit and loss for a given period, the trend of your inflow outflows, the level of investments required to maintain or grow, the value of these documents lies in the story that tells that tell when reviewing together. So the numbers tell a story about you. Truth is. I'm sure if I ask all of us here, how many of us need finance? And I'm sure most of us will say we need it. But question is, how ready are we? Almost every day, I'm sure Gideon will say the same thing. You get people emailing you, telling you they have some money, they, you have an entrepreneur who meets the standard. And sometimes, you, if you don't take care, you just, you just go and destroy your own name. So I remember... Think about four years ago, five years ago, um, we were asked by some Germans to bring some of our entrepreneurs to come and pitch at a thing somewhere at Osu. And then when we got there, something happened. When we got there, I was with one of the entrepreneurs that I trusted that, oh, Charlie, she's doing good. And so then we met Freswanika. I don't know if any of, any of you know, know him. The guy who owns the, the African Leadership Academy. 
And Fred is Ghanaian South African. This guy, she's, he's lived in South Africa, so somehow you feel like he's... But Fred is an entrepreneur. So when I met Fred, um, so he asked me what we were doing there. So we just came to some pitch to some German uh, um, parliamentarians, actually. I think they were trying to see how they can collaborate with German businesses. And so Fred asked me whether I have any of my entrepreneurs that um, they can have a conversation. I said, oh, yeah. So I, yeah, I went to bring this lady. I said, Charlie, come and pitch to Fred. You never know. Yeah, that day, but I wish I told Fred that um, later. <laughs> you know, so, so please, let's be prepared in a, there's something called elevator, elevator pitch. You should always be prepared. If somebody, if you meet your, your business God today, you prepare to receive your, your blessing. And, and so our numbers help us to be able to tell the story of our business. So the first statement we want to look at is the balance sheet. A balance sheet. So, if you if you know, we did the accounting equation, and balance sheet basically is the accounting equation. Say so asset equals to liabilities plus owners equity, and that is that is that's the entire thing of, of of a balance sheet. So, a balance sheet is a financial document designed to communicate exactly how much a company or organization is worth, which is what we call its book value. And to achieve this, we try and put together all the assets of the organization, all the liabilities of the organization, and all the equity of the organization. So what we are saying is that we try and see what is in the possession of the business now and who those money or who those possession belongs to. We said yesterday, or I think two days ago, that all that the business has now, some belong to other people, external people, and that's what we call liability. And some belong to the owners. You should be able to classify and understand which belongs to the owner and which belongs to an external person. Once we don't catch that, we spend people's money. And we have to either go bankrupt or that we get in trouble with our, with our business. So like I said, sometimes we prepare these things also in periodic basis. If you have people who, are, who want to make sure that they are checking you all the time, basically, they have to they have to you know follow you up to make sure you are you are at a place where you are matured then they want to prepare you to repair balance sheet every every month let's see how much we are worth now one one thing you also have to understand about balance sheet is that balance sheet is like a picture it's like taking a picture it tells you the situation at that particular time. So if you have a picture right now, it is telling you the story of the day you took the picture. Why do we have to have a balance sheet? Because it serves primarily two purposes. One is that when it is reviewed internally, it is designed to give insight into whether a company is succeeding or failing. And based on that, policies and approaches can be shifted. You can then focus on your successes, correct failures, and working, work, start working towards new opportunities. Those of you who like sports, Today, is it Ghana Blackstar is going to play again. So if you if you, you are somebody who evaluates 
then you begin to put them together. If some, this person is here, it would have it will serve as the best. If this person is here, it will serve as the best. That's how that's how the balance sheet help us internally. When the balance sheet is reviewed externally, it's designed to give insight into the resources available to your business and how they were financed. So again, we've said that the resources that are available to the organization belong to two sets of people. One are those who own the business, and the other is those who are just doing business or have um, some working relationship with the business. And those ones doesn't belong to the owners, but those resources are available to the business, but it's not for the owners. Based on this information, potential investors can decide whether it would be wise to invest or not. And now that we are looking at growth, you have to think about people also coming into your organization to, to evaluate, to check whether what you are spending is the right thing you are spending, what you wrote that you spent, is it actually what you spent? Um, to audit and to give some recommendation, to give an opinion of what your business is. Our job is to come and see whether um, you are spending your money well. And mostly, every auditor will tell you that the auditor's objective is to give the shareholder value. So we are giving an opinion to the shareholder that the managers are not using the money well. Well, interestingly, most of us, I'm sure that most of us, we are the shareholders and we are the managers. We are playing two roles. And as, as we, we, we say this, I just want to also draw attention that every business has three actors. There is the entrepreneur or maybe the one who had a dream. There is the investor, the one who put money in it. And then there's the manager, the one who understands to manage it. This has been one of the challenges of our continent in the ecosystem. Mostly, once it's our dream, we think that we are the who can manage it. In most places, people hire people to come in. They hire expect to come and manage the business for them. Because they know that all they had was the dream. And normally it is, it is, it makes you, it gives you the confidence to evaluate from behind. So we should be thinking about growing our business in such a way that very soon we will exit and then allow managers to run so that we can sit maybe on the board or our shareholders. It's important to remember that a balance sheet communicates information as of a specific date. So like I mentioned, this is like a picture. It tells you the date, the time, the specific moment you took the, you, you, you took that shot. That's how a balance sheet is. And by its very nature, it is always based on historical data. So we are saying that, of course, because we are saying that if you're preparing by balance sheet, that's why you see that it is as at. If it's at 31st December, then it means that what fed the balance sheet was things that happened before 31st December or up until 31st December. While investors and stakeholders may use a balance sheet to predict the future performance, past performances are not usually a guarantee of future results. And so normally we want to look at the trend So the content of a balance sheet. So as you have said, we've said we said most of these things yesterday. I'm sorry. Said so that the content is just the accounting equation. Asset equals to liability plus one equity. All right. So first question: If you make liability the subject, what will the equation be? Anybody to answer? Yes. Assets 
will be uh, liabilities minus. You said if we make the Li liabilities the subject. The subject, then the as assets minus ownership. It's going to be asset minus um, owner's equity. Are you sure? Well, and if I make a liability, liability the subject. No, so then L will be um, A divided by the owner's equity. That's a pure mathematical equation. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking that since it is a plus sign here, that it will be a negative. So liabilities will be uh, the assets minus the owner's equity. It will bad. be a fraction of, the, <laughs> yeah, because I'm on my mathematical, uh, this, if A equals L plus O, uh -huh. then if I make liabilities the subject here, uh -huh. and then the owners crosses the equal line. Hello. Yeah, okay, so, so my answer is um asset minus um owner's equity, which will give you liabilities. Are you sure? I Am I getting the wrong, wrong equation? Because I, I'm hearing um division. Yeah, because <laughs> because in any algebra, you see once, <laughs> once this is an equal sign. Where there's an equal sign, if the asset, should, if uh, this should cross, you know, if if the owner's equity should cross to the left side, when we make liabilities the subject, that's what it means. So then the liabilities become the subject. If or we can say the assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity, that would be one equation, and the liabilities will be um, the owner's equity minus assets. Then we have to have two equations here. Now you say you are saying hey, that's all different. But <laughs> doing doing <laughs> just doing this once that you cannot say that okay, you could easily say it's assets minus owners equity to give you uh, actually, the actually actually that is the correct one. I was just trying to be sure that the one who said it is really sure of herself, but Larisha um, didn't seem to have the confidence. No, but I'm sorry, I, 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 I was like, that's my network is kind of and I was saying bad that today. That. So I was like, I'm uh, confused. <laughs> I'm using the, the usual asset equal to liability plus owner's equity equation or something else. <laughs> the same thing. I wanted to just be sure that you you are so certain of what you are saying. This one there, I'm certain 100%. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, that also help you to understand that you can also present the balance sheet in different ways. So, you remember, when we were, when we were, when we were dealing with the accounting equation, we had a similar, we had a question, and we we're struggling to know how to deal with the question. But it is just the equation, knowing which to, what to make subject and what, you know, to, to factor in those subjects. Well, Arisha, you're already in the accounting uh, field. <laughs> so I was thinking that this one, this this course will be your uh, your trump, if I should say that to you. No, it's not the other Laurentia. This is uh, Laurentia and Day. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's not the other Laurentia. That's the, that's the problem for me. Okay. Mm. All right. So if a balance sheet doesn't balance, it's likely that the document was prepared incorrectly. This is, this is a pure math thing. One plus one, BI two. There's no foreign material. So if your one plus one is getting you one and a half, it means that there's something wrong. You see that uh, this equation that you have given, like I said, I have my mathematical lens on. For us, it, it doesn't work that way. Once it crosses, it becomes, but now I get it. Yeah. Just like this. So you you present as you see. So if it doesn't balance, it means that there is something that was not properly um, rendered. And those errors could be due to incomplete or missing data or that a transaction wasn't entered correctly. I know that some of us 
we use either we are using Excel or we're using some softwares. There are a lot of free softwares actually. Um, that if if you did any of them, we can have a found that um accounting softwares that you can use for your business. It's and so I would cool. always advocate for you to have something that you are doing so you don't need to calculate some of these things. There are people have sat down to design things for us, so let's try and use them. It's 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 helpful. Now those three components, I said it. So this one is just a recap. Assets is divided into either a current or non-current. And previously, we used to call we used to call it non-current fixed, but the CIA is here over a fixed beam. It's called non-current assets. Um, this is not a pure accounting class. We would have said that even the presentation of it. Those who are using IFRS use a different presentation. Those who are using GAD use a different. But but what we're just saying is that the components, the component of the assets are either it is a current asset or it's a non-current asset. A non-current asset um, are those who you know whose maturity or who we mostly the ones that we use to do production or we help our operations. So if you remember this question, Gideon asked, how do you, you know, differentiate between the current and non-current? And I answered on that day that normally you're looking at current, current as those that can be converted into cash within a year, like your stock, like your bank, you know, like your cash itself. Then the liability too can be can be um divided into two, just as the 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 asset as current and non-current the same way. And that's one to, if you're looking at non-current as long-term liability and the current as short-term liability. Short-term, you are looking at up to one year. And then owner's equity is comprised of the owner's um, share of the, of the business. So how much money you put in there as maybe the, your form of equity, your contribution, what is the contribution? Um, at this moment, we can use contribution more than shares. What is contribution? So the money that you put in there, uh, sometimes you put the money in there and you didn't just put that as working capital. Maybe you use the money to buy some fixed assets and then you use it to buy a vehicle for the, for the organization. You use to buy a, um, a plant or things like that. But that's, you can do the valuation of that particular asset and, and then know that this is how much I put in the business. But the other thing that also contributes to those equity is the, the retained earnings, the earnings that are distributed to the owners. It also adds up to your contribution to become the owner's equity. This one, we've done it, so we don't have a problem. Now, I want you to look at this sample balance sheet. Now, forget about the numbers. Just forget about the numbers. I just want to point out some important things that will help you to read your balance sheet. Just forget about the numbers, but look at where I have put one, two, three, and four. Those gives some important information that I want you to take note of. So when you look at one, what do you see? What do you see labeled as one? Anybody? That's the non-current assets. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody else? One is non-current assets. Okay, you also see non-current assets. Anybody else? Anybody and current different? assets. I don't know, but where you put the two? Is it? Okay, we have... Uh, total assets. What, what is what is the number written beside? See that we don't don't. don't so the date between. Is okay. Is a number of a given date. A date, yes. Okay, so one is a date. It is mm -hmm. it is placed on a uh, by a date. Mm -hmm. So it tells you the period. Okay. That the period ends on June 30th, 2020. And it is compared against a similar reporting period from the prior year. Do you see that? Okay. 
the this this, okay. this balance sheet is a comparison of the position as at 2020 June and 2090 June. Okay. So it helps you, like I said, it gives you a trend. So I say, oh, last year by this time, this is where we were. Okay, so Harry, it means that when you are preparing a balance sheet, it should always have a reference point from an earlier date. When you are doing, when you are doing the the trend analysis, so most people will do it annually. So they will just make it maybe 30, 31st December 2020, and they will compare to 31st December 2019. And maybe if there's a five year something, they will want to. Mostly, you will see a three year comparison. They will compare okay. the like the previous two years to see whether they are. What just so the first one is just to tell you what you're comparing, okay? Right, then number two, what do you see? Figures, what's figure? Uh, the total assets, right? So, number two is giving us the company's total assets That's by the compared in comparison with the previous year at the same time. So, you notice that. As of 2019, the total asset organization was 60, 60 million, mm -hmm. right? 60 million, 188. Yes. But a year later, it has reduced. Yeah. So you this tells you that oh, you have to then go details it, tell you what's going on. Now the worth of the company has reduced. That's what it means. This That's what it means totally for you. That the value of the company has reduced. It has reduced by about 15 million. So you need to ask yourself what happened? Then, number three, what do you see? Oh, sorry. What do you see? Spain on. All right. What do you see at number three? It's a figure for total liabilities. liabilities. Okay, total liabilities. So you will see yes. you will see that a year by the time, so let's say we are talking about 2020. A year by this time, their liability, people that they owe was 16 million and 84 and then now they have added more liabilities they are owing more people they are owing, owing more money more, almost 250 I think it's coming from the accrued expenses and other the mm -hmm. deferred revenues right so that's what I that's what I want you to do. So now, once you see that, it you have to tell you you have to go and then check what is causing us to have that that more um, liability. And then the number four, what do you see? Total liabilities and shareholders. Okay, and that also number four also. Um, gives you at least it compares the retained earnings with the liabilities and tells you the um, how much it is that you are. So, so you notice that the thing balanced with total assets. When you add total liability and equity, you get the same as total assets. But you can break it down. You will notice that forty three thousand eight hundred thirty forty three million eight hundred thirty five. Or let me just make it simple. What is it, 1835 is the owner's part of the 60,000. It's also not the equity. Okay. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. The 43,000 is the owner's part of the 60,000. Mm -hmm. And the 60,000 is the entire resources of the business, is the entire value. If you do a valuation of the ex company, as at 30th 30, 30 June 2019. 
2020, the, the company is worth 60,173. And that worth, out of it, 43,835 belong to the owners. The rest belong to other people. Are we good with balance sheets? Any questions with balance sheets before we move on? I've actually made it simpler than I thought it would be. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's move to the next one then. The next one is income statement. The income statement. An income statement also known as we used to call it profit and loss, summarizes the cumulative impact of revenue, gains, expenses, and loss transactions for a given period. Now, let me give you a very simple way that you can, you can differentiate an income statement from a balance sheet. So I mentioned earlier that a balance sheet is like um, taking a shot, a picture, right? Mm -hmm. So, so it tells you the position that you are at that time. But an income statement is like taking a video. It, it tells you from which point to which point you take the video. Is it, is it, is it clear? It is more comprehensive than... More the balance. It's more comprehensive than the balance sheet. Yeah, you can say that. Yes, you can tell. You can say that it, it gives you uh, it's more comprehensive. But at least what we are saying is that um, usually you will find out that they will put a balance sheet and say for a period of, okay, because it is giving you cumulative balance. It's just telling you how it is. Those, Capturing. The, yes. Yeah, and this one is the flow. The income mm -hmm. statement is the flow as in a video, right? Yes, just like a video. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the document is often shared. Again, we add, we just say that we, everybody who has seen a balance sheet means that you see that there's an income statement attached to it. And sometimes, and usually there are figures in the income that feed into the balance sheet, especially like the retained earnings. It comes from the income statement. So why? is income statement important. An income statement tells the story of a business's finances or the activities. It tells the financial story of a business activity. So you know when you are telling a story, you start from a point, how we were, how we started, how we had to struggle. So you go back to tell the story. So within an income statement, you find all the revenue lines and all the expenses for a set period. And usually the source document for, for income statement is what we call a trial balance. And the trial balance usually is more detailed than the income statement. Let me add here, just, just for saying that, maybe you may not really um, fully understand, but one of the reasons why the, the travelers will have more detail than the, the income statement is a concept we call relevance. I mean, there are certain things that you don't need to, you know, bring them in detail in the financial report. If you want the details, you go to the travelers, you've signed those do details, but sometimes you aggregate them. So for instance, you have operate, operating, let's say operating expenses. In the operating expenses, you went to buy brew, you went to buy water, you went to buy a scratch card. You know, you put all these things together and make it operating expenses in your income statement. But in your your travels, you see them. But this is this small small things. You can come. You can list all these small small things in, a, in an income statement for everybody to just see. So if you want to see the real work, when an auditor comes, they don't they don't come and look at your income statement, even if you have prepared it. Normally, you prepare it after they've audited. But 
If you want to do that, they will go into your trial balance to check and see the details. So from an income statement and other financial documents, you can determine whether the business is get, generating a profit or not. If it's spending more than it's earning, if its costs are higher or lower, how much it's paying to produce its products, and whether it has the cash to invest back into the business. These are relevant things that you want to know about your business, right? Okay, so why is the income statement, the income statement tells a story, the business, oh, this is what we just did, okay. The content of the income statement, while all financial data help point a, paint a picture of a company's financial health, an income statement is one of the most important documents a company's management team or, or the, the owners. And maybe anybody who wants to put money or who has their money in the business can review because it includes a detailed breakdown of income and expenses over a course of a reporting period. So in the income statements, you see headings like revenue, which becomes money, and money that the business made and reported for the period. You see expenses, which is the amount of business the business spent during the period. You see the cost of goods sold, the cost of com co the cost components of the, the sales, the gross profits, which is the total revenue minus the cost of goods. I'm sure you have seen the metric that we did in the, on day one. The operating income yeah, nah, is, nah. yes. The operating income is your gross profits minus your operating expenses. The income before taxes are your operating income minus your operating expenses. Net income is income before taxes, less taxes. <laughs> so it is just, it is just this okay. one, the number six. You know, we say income before taxes, right? Okay. So when you get that, that, that the taxes. when you take the taxes out of it, then you get to the net profit. Earnings per share is a dividend. Is, is, is dividing the net income by the total number of outstanding share, the share that have been sweeter. So the net earnings are basically how much money that you can distribute. And so you distribute some more the people who own the organization. And we say depreciation is the extent of use of um, equipment. And this is one way that we are, a lot of us don't depreciate our assets. Marisha, do you depreciate your assets? No, so this is because um, the, the most of the machineries that are used are, are not by us, are not for us, because we outsource the production to a different um, entity. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so you don't, do. have, you don't you don't have machinery. All right. So if you have, then you have to depreciate it. Otherwise, when it breaks down, you get any any replacement. And again, that depreciation also help you to put money aside. Mary, I have a question. Yes, please go ahead. There are some okay. of our machinery by uh, virtue of generating heat gets broken down beyond repair and needs replacements frequently. So um, how do I, will that be depreciation? For instance, we have a homogenizer that we use to mix 
and our mixers that we use to mix our products. Some of them, even right during operation, they can break down. And, you know, they can, I don't know, but it, the fuse can break and destroy the whole thing. It needs replacement. So in that case, uh, it's not a depreciation. It's an outright replacement. So how do I have a part of that one? And I believe land is not depreciated, or does land depreciate? I think land appreciates. Oh yes, if you have land, you don't you don't depreciate it. Yeah. So there are premises where you work. Um, but that, that where you work is it yours? It is. You, yeah, you can, you can yeah. The, the building you can create something because you have to do repairs and maintenance on the building. Yes, that's true. But I want to know about the machine that needs to be replaced. Okay. And where to factor it in depreciation? But depreciation okay. so, is like the value has reduced, but this thing is, is gone, so it's gone. Okay, let me let me explain that part. The value is manual. So what it means yes. is that when you make profit, if if you say that you are depreciating by let's say um six percent, when you make profit, you have to take that six percent and put it aside. That money doesn't belong to you. Basically, it is All right. it's a depreciation. That is what you can use to purchase new one, oh. right? And normally we can depreciate assets are not called negative. And then we will be repairing the assets and then take all the money that we depreciated into repairs and maintenance. Okay. Then so, the thing has gone bad. In our case, we have maybe two or three at a time. And um, so if you have three and we lose one, it's still depreciation. So <laughs> we have lost, lost value, like you said. Okay. No, so what, what I'm saying is that depreciating is putting money aside. Aside. The, yes. So it is not a. It is not. It is not. Okay. So when I say that it is the the loss of value. Over time. It is the reason you are putting the money aside. So you are you are assuming that every time that you use the machine, it loses some value. Okay. So that value you must you must plan for it. And so that's so mostly. When you put any asset in, in service, you need to have a depreciation system. Say, okay, I'm going to use this asset for the next five years, right? Mm -hmm. And so, okay, five years. The value of the asset is, say, um, 10,000 Ghana cities. I want to use it for five years. So then I will have to know how much will I have to depreciate to get to that much. And sometimes, once that it's five years, what I can do is that I can even sell it for something cheap. But whatever I get, I add it to the, the money that I, I depreciated and then we'll go and buy a new one. Okay. But the place is money that you're setting aside. It's like invest, it's like um, okay. savings. Yeah, that makes, that makes more sense. Right. So this is one of the metrics that we did last time. So this time I'm trying to put the metrics in work so that uh, it, it in the formulas. Because form. yes, <laughs> listening to this, there, there are other things that we use that um out. So today the, the internet is not helping Laurentia. I tell you, yeah, depreciation <laughs> to it. Thank you. I, I didn't hear I didn't hear anything. The let Oh, just sorry. Hit, hit the Can you go again? Yeah, there are other assets and machinery that we are using that I didn't think were too expensive for us to for us to actually um um. Do. Oh. Appreciation on, but it, it has to be done. And yes. I have a clear yeah. Yes, yes. So if it's expensive, it means that it is all you can do is to have a longer year. So sometimes you can depreciate an asset over, let's say, 20 years, over 15 years, right? Over 10 years, over five years. But some of them, Charlie, I did the Ambrose one, three years, it will be gone. Or you yourself, you want to say that, look, I want to depreciate this thing. I want to have a zero value of this asset 
in the next three years. So it is, I watch it at 8,000 cities. What it means is that three years, I have to divide it by three, so and they know annually how will I depreciate it. Okay, Henry, um, I have this scenario. Mm -hmm. um, I have a mixer. It is a steel mixer. Mm -hmm. But we realized that it was corroded. So um, I had to get one of um team uh, Syntropy to polish it for me. And it cost me 250 cents to polish it. So um, it's a very strong machine, but um, it has, uh, um, in this case, they have added more value to it. Uh, how, where will I put it? Because you said that it's earnings uh, that you put aside or money, you, uh, value of money you put aside to replace yes. it. Yes. It's also yes. to repair it. Mm -hmm. So, so there's repairs and maintenance. When you repair okay. and maintain, usually, usually, if you want to know that, no, it, okay. So this is the thing: <laughs> the appreciation of it. I mean, you cannot just look at it and say it has appreciated. So, so let's say, let's say, you can only know the value that it has appreciated when you are disposing it off. Okay. Right. So, okay. so usually, let's say that, and sometimes some organizations have depreciation uh, rates, you can say that we depreciate, let's say, building at 5%, we depreciate, um, uh, um, let's say, vehicle at, at 10%, um, they, they have depreciation rates. What it means, it would also mean is that you can actually depreciate the thing into, into zero and, and then decide to say, okay, look, I want to dispose it of. You can get mm -hmm. extra money, and so you notice that you made a profit. But mostly, when you, if you put additional money to do repairs and maintenance, then you have to know that your depreciated money that you have saved, basically, you are used some for the repairs and maintenance. Okay. You are trying to see the how much the asset is giving you. Oh, last. Okay. Okay. So earning before interest, tax, and depreciation. The position and amortization that we said, it is a measure of a company's ability to generate cash flow that is calculated by adding net profit, interest, taxes, depreciation and amortization together. So this is just a formula that it that equals to net profit plus interest plus taxes plus depreciation plus amortization all right so this also is a sample income statement please can you identify the numbers for me net sales what is what? Where is one? One is the gross profits. Okay, so one is gross profits. So it's, I mean, it's telling us what what constitute the gross profits. It is your net sales, and when we say net sales, um, I, mean, I remember when we were doing accounting when I was in very school we doing accounting. We used to have a lot of things that were <laughs> we were just studying things that we didn't really understand what it was. So there were carriages. <laughs> There are things, you know. Sometimes when you travel and you see the things that we used to study, we didn't even know the meaning of them. <laughs> and then, like, like in Ghana, there are people charging goodwill. And you're asking yourself, what, what, what did they even get those things from? You know. So, so net sales also means that maybe you made some sales, you have to uh, somehow to return what you sold to them. Factoring everything together, what you got at the end, because of the net sales. And then you're looking at the cost of sales. When you take the cost of sales from the net sales, what you get becomes your gross profit. So this was one of the metrics that we, we spoke about the last time. And then what do you see at number two? Total operation. Expenses. 
and operating income. Number two. Oh, no, no, it's it's rather operating income. All right. So number two is operating income. So we see that the the organization brought five hundred and sixty million. Um. Spend four hundred sixty million on selling and operating expenses. They spend two hundred ninety three million on. Oh, let me let me make it easy. Two hundred ninety three thousand on um general administrative expenses. So you remember what I just told you that in the income statements you will see full. So for instance, this general and administrative expenses. If you go into a, into a trial balance, you may see what actually give you this thing. It may be things that are petty things that have been put together. Okay. Yes, and oh. then when, when you put all those, you got a total that you call total operating expenses. So when you take that total operating expenses out from your gross profit, what you get is total is operating income. Okay. So operating income equals net, sorry, gross profit minus operating expenses. What do you see at number three? Income, income tax. Yes. Okay. So at that part two, you will see that the taxes, normally the taxes will come with the rates. So you see that before the, the taxes, there is a total that is giving us income before taxes. Yes, that, that, that's 740,000. Right, and that income before taxes is basically you, you after you've gotten your operating income, if you made any other gains, maybe you got additional income from unrelated business or other, other activity that is not directly the operation that you are doing. Um, so for instance, let's say that um, you, you mentioned that the um, customers bear the cost of transportation. And so assuming that you have people that do the delivery. And so you tell the customer that if you are in um, hard to you pay 20 CDs addition. And yet, what you actually pay to the, the transport operator is let's say 18 CDs. What you get two CDs becomes additional. Okay. Right. And then if you take any other, maybe the interest expense, you have your money in the bank, you are charging you COT and things. These are all other expenses that you would want to also factor in then. So when you take all those other income and expenses out or add it to your operating income, what you get is an income that is before the IRS call you to tax you. Henry, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. The other income, is that mm -hmm. gain or loss on financial instruments? Oh, and then the other one is loss or gain of foreign currency. Mm -hmm. Like, um, sure. Sure. I'm in trouble, Martin. Uh -huh. sure. <laughs> I just want you to understand the concept. Okay. Because these things, this, this is a foreign, this is a company that has foreign trades. Okay. Right. So, um, and I'm sure some of you, you can even have some of these things even in your balance sheets. Sorry, in your income statement. Because... Some of you, you buy things from outside. Yeah. And and sometimes and people also buy it from money. us. We yes, pay it at the dollar, money. and then uh -huh. loses sometimes value. You lose money, yes. and then you don't factor them in. Yeah. But at this point, that that part is not really because your your lines may be a bit different. Just just the concept that when you take those um income and then other expenses that is not part of your printing income expenses out of your printing income expenses you get to an income that is before your taxes are charged now once you get that one 
then the IRS will apply 25% or whatever percentage. The last time we did, when we did one accelerator program for our people at Tenth Middle, we, we told them some of the tax incentives that IRS has. Um, if you, especially when we are doing agro, agro processing, there are a lot of incentives that you can you can get. And I mean, pr production itself, um, most of us, uh, because we are not aware, we pay money, they come and then they harass us, we have to pay money to them. But basically, once we take your taxes from the income before the tax, you get to net income. Cash flow. So I'm beginning to make sense. Hello. Hello. Should we go back? I'm saying that things are beginning to make sense. <laughs> okay. Good to hear. Making a lot of sense. Yeah. I'm glad. Hi, Henry. Um, please, I, I need your help in understanding something. Okay. Yes. Uh, the other time I was actually in the central market and then I saw the IRS um, officials around and they went straight into a shop. Even carrots receipt books to them because the person has not been paying their tax, the, the, the shop's taxes. Um, on another occasion, there was this, um, they say, uh, oh, municipal assembly tax, something of this, that sort. And they, they were going around to take those taxes. And when they come to a, a shop, they look at what is in there, what is in the shop. And then they... Um, they, they say oh, you're yeah, in this category or that category. But I know that taxes are paid on profits. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I, I have actually heard and I've kept in mind. Right. But it turns out that it's not a, it's, it doesn't look the same way with these two uh, scenarios I've given. So, uh... yeah. Well, it is, it is on, on profit, just like you said. There's something we call estimated tax. Normally, they will do that when, so like you said, the first scenario you gave, you said somebody was not paying the taxes. Sometimes they come and do the estimated tax because they, they have an assumption that you make this much more, much profit, right? Uh, in, in some jurisdictions, you have to pay it by yourself. And when you do, we pay those things on quarterly basis. If you don't pay those quarterly basis, um, the next quarter, they can even surcharge you and things like that. But, you you only pay tax when you have earned an income or you have earned you've gotten an excess income of our expense but the only reason so but you see again the challenge is that mostly most of these people we are talking about they don't even record their taxes so the the person the came to the bank they don't of course they don't prepare any any accounts <laughs> The reason why they do that to them is because they know they don't prepare any accounts. So they don't they will not even know that they are making losses. So they'll harass them. But you who know that you know your work, you should be able to indicate in your books that this is my margin. So so I, if I need to pay, this is how much I have to pay. But like I said, I think Ghana also have the same dispensation. Every quarter you are supposed to make an estimated tax payment. Um I, when I read a tax law in Ghana, it was a little funny because here, here in the United States, they are, the people are excited in tax year. So, for instance, um, I, I, at my company, we do taxes, and usually we do taxes for companies, and we do taxes for we do training on taxes for individuals. And one of the things that that people are excited about when it comes to taxes is that they know that if they overpay, they get refunds. Mm -hmm. So people are always looking for refunds. And when I read the tax law in Ghana, the refund, we have to go and mm -hmm. do some justification, mm -hmm. some things that um, it doesn't it enjoy, you know. But I'm <laughs> sure people, are, people have not really chased 
And you see, because some of these things, they get it from the small business. They won't do this to big organizations. Because they prepare their books so you will see how much they, if they paid more, they can bring it to you and say, look, we pay 300, so for instance, this one, we pay 300,000, but when we when we got to prepare our books, we noticed that our actual um, tax liability was 257,642. So if we have prepaid tax, it goes into our balance sheet as prepaid. It is it now becomes um part of our our um our prepayment. Right. So in the subsequent the next year, even if they don't refund it to me the next year, I can deduct those difference from a tax liability. I think there's a way to get it here in Ghana. You see, for the scenario that Laurisha mentioned, most of the time, this exercise is to get the people to come to their offices and have a, open up a, a, their books there. So if they come to you and you have your records, they will go by that. Um, in fact, uh, when you go there, I remember that we had a shop at the central market. We had an instance like that. And when we went there, the, the other person asked, who is this shop for? It was for my mom. She was quite elderly. And so he said, you know that I can even enjoy tax relief. And he said, ah, mm. we didn't know. So they told us that what you have not sold, we will not come for. But if you provide us on a quarterly basis, like you were saying, then they won't have to come to you, but you have to go to them and present to them what you sold. And then to be a percentage, but you know the Ghanaian culture, people will not always go up front. Yeah. I think it's even the same for us small uh, businesses. We don't like to part with our money. So, <laughs> yeah. So right. yes, I I think that we we just have to. I guess we get a concept also of the of the income statement. I see, I don't know, I'm, I don't know whether it is the network that is causing people to leave. Now we are left with six. If the, if me and the Harper Space person are out, there are four people on the line. It might be, I'm using two devices. Oh, so you are the only three. Yes, so it's possible. <laughs> that is why that's happening. Okay, that's a business opportunity right there. <laughs> Okay, cash flow statement. The last one on the financial report. And the cash flow statement provides a detailed picture of what's happened to a business's cash during a period that is being reported. It demonstrates an organization's ability to operate in the short and long term based on how much cash is flowing into and out of the organization. Why is that also important? When we read the, the cash flow statement, we are able to see how much cash different, how much cash the different um, activities generate and spend then we can make some business decisions on them. So it's important to note that cash flow is different from profits and loss, which is why a cash flow statement is often interpreted with other financial documents. Okay, the component of cash flow. So cash flow also has three key components. Broken down into cash flow from operating activities, cash flow from investing activities. So don't don't assume that cash flow is just the operations that you are doing. No, they are different. So for instance, if you go and put money in the bank and they it generates for you an interest, it is not a cash flow from your operation. All right. So creating activity details cash flow that is generated once the company deliver its regular goods and services and include both revenue and expenses. The investing activities 
comprised of cash flow from purchasing and selling assets using cash. This is usually in the form of physical properties such as building or vehicle or non-physical properties like patents. If you have a patent, you can also sell it and that is whatever you, you, you get from, from that sale is under the investing activity. You don't go and put that one as that your business is doing well when you're operating active, no. Because that is not from the business's operation. Hey, is that so? Yes. Because I buy packaging in SS and then I sell some of it and it brings good cash into my hands. It's like, so that one is just a different activity from what I do. Mainly. Yes, that is so, not from your operation. So now I cannot add it to my daily sales, but I have to no. find well, you can even to add it to your daily sales, then you have to separate that unless unless okay, so unless that part of it it's also so, so you are considering that as a product. You know, you can just go and buy and resell the packaging and that becomes the operation. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh -huh. So that's if how you, I've always if you, that it. Yes, if you think that that's part of your operation, that's fine. But if you if you buy physical properties and you sell them, or let 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 for instance, let's say that you have um you bought a property that you have run office there, but you have space, and that space mm -hmm. that you have, you lease part of it to other people. That lease is not a part of the operation. Okay. It's an investment that you made that is generated. It's just that this is just like going to put money in a bank and the bank giving you interest. Okay. okay. Then the third activity is the financing activity, which detail cash flow from debt and equity financing. So loans, and then if you just maybe somebody invested. Like the scenario we gave you the last time, the 200,000 that Papa Space gave you as an investment, those are investment activities. So, so um, in some jurisdiction, when you pay dividend, they classify it some way. The way IFR classifies is different from the way um, GAP. I, I won't bore you with that. <laughs> I don't want to take you to accounting class. This is just overview. So ideally, cash from operating income should routinely exceed net income. A positive cash flow speaks to a company's financial stability and ability to grow its operation. How do we interpret the cash flow? Cash flow statement can reveal the face of a business, whether it's a rapidly growing startup or a mature and profitable company. It can also review whether a company is going through transition or in a statement of decline. So as an entrepreneur, you must look at the cash flow statement to understand how your business is doing and use that inside to plan your team's activity. Cash flow statement can review the face of, oh, okay, hold on. Okay, cash flow might also impact internal decisions such as budgeting and whether to hire or fire an employee. Positive cash flow indicate that a company has more money flowing into the business than out of it over the set period. This is an ideal situation because having an excess of cash flow, the company can reinvest or settle some of its debts or find new ways of growing the business. So that's why I, I gave you I'll give you I gave you three ways that you can invest without going to put your money in T bills or put your money in um, what was, what was the other one? 
um, fixed deposit can do backward integration by investing into your raw material or do forward integration by investing into your supplies. Those who deal in hardware, they do a lot of forward integration. So instead of them to be you know, dealing with truck drivers, they themselves start investing in trucks to do delivery. And sometimes you can do horizontal integration as well. Some competition, you can even venture into. So now Facebook is owning the other more small ones, um, WhatsApp and other things. That, they all look like the same, similar business. But that is horizontal integration, just to diversify. It help you to diversify. If you're a business owner, you should always look at the maximum investment that you can generate. You know, yes, last time we were talking about having interest upon the interest, compounding the interest. Positive cash flow does not necessarily translate to profit. A business can be profitable without being cash flow positive. So, for instance, one one reason, one example I can give is that let's say you you make sales, uh, and then the payment is supposed to be going into an asset that you bought. Yes, you are making sales, you are making profit, but the money is not coming. You are not getting cash. So your cash flow may even be negative, but yet you are making profit. So from the beginning, we said that cash flow, you have to look, you have to um, analyze your cash flow together with other financial reports. And you can have positive cash flow without actually making profit. A negative cash flow means your cash flow outflow is higher than your cash inflow during a period. But it does not necessarily mean you have made loss and we've said the counterpart of that. Negative cash flow may instead be caused by expenditure and income as much, which should be addressed as soon as possible. Negative cash flow may also be caused by your company's decision to expand and invest in future growth. So it's important to analyze the change in cash flow from one period to another, which can indicate how the business is performing overall. Okay. So we have another sample of report. What do you see at one? Cash and cash equivalent. Beginning of the year, of the amount. Right. So in the cash flow, you want to see what you brought into the period of reporting. So the first thing that usually was you will start with is the beginning balance of your cash. All right, what do you see at number two? Cash generated by operating activities. So the operating activity, like I said, it is your 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 main business activity. So you see, you see that in there, there's net income in there, in there, there is inventory in there. You see other non-current assets. Accounts payable. And then number three is investing activity. So like we said, at that point, you see that approximately 33,000 was spent in investment. So that's why you see a negative figure there. (laughs) 
Then you see number four, financing activity. So you see the components that are there. And then after that, you will come to your net cash flow at the end. So you see that before you get to the, to the net cash flow at the end, there is a change in cash flow, which is and which for the period of for the period you came with 10,764. You don't add them in between. So in between, what you are just doing that you'll be adding all the cash flows together, the three. So you add number two, number three, and number four. And that is what becomes the change in your cash flow. And then after that, whatever you get, you add it to the beginning balance to get to the end balance. Fortunately, this, this statement is showing us a positive cash flow and it's showing an increase of 3513. In the question, hey, should we go to the ROI? Or you no, want to? This is this is good. I mean, um, it's it's made it simple. Uh, it's more understandable looking at the tables that you have provided. You know, like somebody who says it's all about numbers. And sometimes, you know, uh, it's difficult to get. But when you break it down like this, it's like it tells the whole story of what your activities in your business. Absolutely. The, the objective is so that when you see, uh, and like I said, I know that for most of us, we don't need to be doing it by ourselves. But when you see it, you should be able to understand what it means. Should we go ahead and do the ROI? If we're done with this, yeah, I think <laughs> this is self explanatory. Yes, please. Okay. All right. So we can end at the ROI and then I'll be out of your space. Okay. So returns on investment analysis. Return on investment is a metric that we use to, to show the profits that has been generated from an investment that was made in the organization. And knowing how to calculate can, you know, bring a lot of benefits including helping you to make a case for more investment or maybe provide you some insight. Normally, well, so we're going to talk about anticipated and actual, you know, that ROI, if you're able to calculate it, well, it gives you an insight into your organization, how much margins you're expecting to get versus how much margin you actually got. So when we, when we understand how to calculate it, it helps us to know what project that we need to we need to um, pursue and which we don't need to pursue. So all right, so there is the anticipated and actual return on investment. So anticipated usually um, is calculated before you start the business. Or so if, if maybe you want to introduce a new product line or a new service, you can calculate the anticipated return on investment. And often you will use um, estimated costs and revenues and assumptions to arrive at whether there is um, 
a positive return or a negative return. And these figures will often be run through several scenarios. The, the advanced part of this or this of this training, uh, when we get to that part, there, there's a part we do forecasting and we look at the net book value, the net present value, the discounted cash flows and things like that. Um, I know the American was with you. Okay. But usually when you do the anticipated, it helps you to know the risk level and to check whether indeed you want to re you want to introduce that product, you want to go into that business or you want to go into that product. Then the actual is when you have actually put in an investment. Then that time, everything is the real figures that you're using. You're not, you're not using protected again. You're using the real figures. It's just like preparing a cash flow. There is, there's a way you can prepare a discounted cash flow for a project you want to do. Discount it to today and check whether it makes sense to put the money in there or not. So the actual ROI is calculated after a project has concluded and uses final costs and revenues to determine how much profit or return was made compared to what was estimated. Positive versus negative. When a project or business yield a positive return on investment, it can be considered profitable because it produced more in revenue than the cost to incur the product. If it is if it yield a negative return on investment, it means the project costs more to pursue than it will generate revenue. Now, if a project break even, of course, you know that the cost is equal to the revenue. However, depending on, on the project that or the business that you want to undertake, or maybe the product that you want to break to introduce. A break even or even a negative return on investment may be a good, may be still be good for you to pursue. But sometimes you will do a five year projection, and during the five years you still get a negative, negative return on investment. But you know that those things are just helping you to build traction, and that after a certain number of years you get more. So let me give you some for example. Let's say Facebook. When Facebook came, nobody was paying anything for Facebook. Most of the things that we used to get for free, people will go there and advertise their product for free. Nowadays, they are, they are monetizing all of them because they've succeeded in bringing a lot of people to be interested in the platform. Again, we're talking about, so for example, we're talking about network effects here now in Prison. And now they are recouping, they are getting people to pay. So if Facebook presented their ROI and there was negative and the an investor said, no, I, I don't think I want to invest in this thing. It means that the investor is actually not looking at the long term. And just like our brother Ike was also saying yesterday, there are some organizations that are also looking at impact more than um, the the real cash that comes out of the projects. How do you calculate your return on investment? So, I, like I keep on saying, this is something that if you are an entrepreneur, you should be interested in because unless you don't want money, if you want money from somebody, they would bomb me to ask you how much would I get, whether it is local or foreign. Yes, they always ask that question. Yes. So you should, you should, yes. And you yourself, as you put your money in the business, you should be interested in that because you see, there's an opportunity cost for putting your money in business. You could have put the same money in treasury bills or in 
um, fixed deposit. So for instance, if today fixed deposit is returning 15% per annum and your business is returning 10% per annum, then somebody will tell you that it maybe makes sense for you to just close the business and go and put the money in fixed deposit. So you should also be interested in that. In most advanced countries, small, you know, micro organizations are, are more concerned about these things because um, some of them, even though they are small, they are able to still raise money on their capital markets. We have our alternative stock market, but when you go there, you even see SMEs, big companies there. No startup is 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 less than there. Return on investment typically calculated by taking the actual or estimated income from a project and subtracting the actual or estimated cost. So let's see. I did it. I did it somewhere down here. Good. So ROI equals net profit divided by cost of investment multiplied by hundred. So now, as for today, they are giving you all the formulas. And usually, uh, in project finance, there's a little bit of tweak, but I won't bore you with that. That usually is not something that you want. Any question on your return on investment? We want to draw the curtains. Any question? No, the, the equation is, is clear. So today, we've done a lot. But so far, this is what we've done. We've done the financial fluency and accounting equation. We did, uh, I'm not sure we did record keeping. So the pricing one and two, we have done budgeting, financial reports, and, and then we actually did the ROI. Questions? Are there any questions? Okay, at this point, even if your network is worrying, you want to hear your voice. <laughs> oh, well, say, you better cross. No, we are here. Uh, so it's left with you and Laurentia and then Hayford. Maxwell, is Hayford one a member of the cohorts or? Yeah, I'm, here, um, I'm part of the cohort. I'm not oh. a staff. Oh, okay. Okay, good. So you mean that? Oh. Okay. Uh, hello, Henry. Thank you so much for today's session as well. I, I've really enjoyed all the three days, and I, I, I know if I implement all of it, it's really going to help. Oh. help the business grow much better. Um, to assist us yesterday, actually, you mentioned that you'd, you'd, you'd love to assist me um, look at certain things about my business. So um, I'll be looking forward to that. Okay. I will be, I will be, I will be looking forward to that. <laughs> and a big thank you to Hapa Space for making this possible. I'm very grateful. Thank you, too. Okay, yes. That, yes. I want to hear from you. And I want to hear from your daughter. Where is she? Well, I only have to wear yesterday briefly. Are you on? I think she, she had a, she was locked out. <laughs> the network is not so good. Like I said, I'm using two devices. I switch. Yeah, you know, when this thing first came in and I said, short, I was say a financial, it just, we've done it, we've done it. But you know what? What you just did, the clarity, the delivery, I mean, how you, you come, really come to a level 
and uh, I, I, I I'm so wowed by everything you know it's sometimes I wonder why do people like you know they're like do this do that do the records do, do this and that I was like what's the relevance but now you see that I looking at the spread uh, the cash flow the balance sheet and all the other documents I believe that if there is an investor and they have such documents in their hands it's not about how much money I have it's not about trying to convince them that uh, I, I'm the best business or that uh, I can break even when they invest what these things will tell them or the decisions they will make based on these things will be more than I can ever imagine. And I believe that apart from investors, the business itself, you have a grip over it. You know where you are going. There are no assumptions and you really know whether you are making it, you are going to make it or you are failing. Thanks so much. And uh, uh, thank you, Upper Space, for bringing uh, this uh, session to us. It's really, really, really uh, changed everything. And like uh, I was saying, when you talked about pricing yesterday, I really sat down and I was like, when I do a production, though, it's a unit. I only look at it in a unit. But with what you did, yes, you did yesterday, I sat down, I did some profiling. And I realized that there are some people who buy, they buy for their kids, then they buy for other people. So the bank main thing, I, I can even cash in more on it because they have to ask what else is there, what else can I use? So I can really anticipate these things or move ahead to put all of these things in the bundle and then the price them. And I always thought, like I said, they discriminate this. And I was I always had a problem with conscience, but I believe that now that this is settled, uh, I believe I'll be a better businesswoman with my team than uh, we have ever been. Thank you so much. And uh, we will always be coming back for more. Awesome. God bless you. I'm glad to hear. Glad to hear. Okay. Um, before you want to say something? Before I give, yes, Himo. Yeah, so to me, it has been a, a period of unlearning and uh, reassuring the things I thought I knew. So I learned a lot. Um, I was taking note at the same time on the field working. So that's why I was very quiet throughout the session. So I, I apologize for that, but it's been a learning experience. I've had um, brushes of all that was taught, but usually what I do is I, I outsource all my financial services. Though I have an account person, but I source them. So it was helpful for me to better understand and interpret the report so that I can make a good business decision from it than solely relying on external people to do the interpretation for me, which will not be helpful for my business. So I've, I've learned a lot. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Henry. You're welcome. Welcome. Hello. I'm, yes. I'm back again. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know who is handling your internet. The people are just hair center. Hair center. I, I realized that the founder for hair center has has enrolled in um oh. The line is breaking. Simba is a business school. On actually having like grades or bigger. Oh, Larisha. Ideas of making the their business in Ghana or this part of the world. I want to know if um it will be advisable that we we take courses that are business related or business administrative courses that would teach us how to handle the business in ways that can make it grow bigger what, what what is your take on on that okay. what will be your so, take on that thank you yeah so so i i mentioned to you um some of the things that um some some people that are more entrepreneurial will advise you to do um and 
Yeah, what's going on? Okay. So there are things that you need to be very familiar with with your business. One of them is the finance part of it, but also strategy. Um, I remember at Harvard there was there were things that we we were learning that um I would benchmark it to the things that I know. And I will feel that, oh, I thought some of these things I know. The only thing is that the, the difference in some of the, the, the things that you learn is that it gives you different perspective. But again, when, when you have the opportunity to learn with people who are doing similar things as you, you are able to learn, not necessarily at the cost, but with the people. The peer learning alone is enough. And that's why people will always say that the best place for you to learn as a business person is to be in a hub. Because there, when you come, you come and meet innovators just like yourself. They understand the plight you are going through. Right. So it, it's, it's good. I would say that there are things that you need to learn about your business. The number one is, is the finance of it. Because it will be, like I keep on saying, the BMC has the base and the finance of it. But the other thing is the strategy of really, really getting to understand your customers and how you can go ahead of them. And then your, your product modality. Because there are a lot of things that you can do, you know, with, with innovation, with just things that everybody else is doing it. And yet you can just pick something everybody is doing and then change. I used Coco King on the first day, but See, when when I was when I was in Ghana, we were buying. I don't know how much Coco King is now, but we were buying it at five CDs. But those times, we were buying the normal, you know, Coco at one CD. Sometimes even that one is even more than the Coco King one. You may say that they were their packaging was some maybe they put more money also in packaging, but how much was that? Economy of scale, they were selling more than the Coco seller. You go to like a station at one place. You have to wait, come and be in a queue. So it's more of the innovation, understanding who you are selling to and then how you can rate them. But the most important thing is that how much gets to you is properly defined and accounted for. And that's the, the, the job that you do. So one thing also is that, so I run two companies apart from Tentmaker, I also run Prime to Prime. Prime to Prime here in the United States, we do bookkeeping, we do taxes, we do small business consulting. But also we have Prime to Prime, Prime to Prime in Ghana, which also do bookkeeping, we do financial management, uh, we do research for entrepreneurs who are trying to research into the market and to understand whether they need to design new products or they need to... Um, check the satisfaction sub, uh, rate of their, of their customers. These are the things that we do also. So yes, I would advise that if you get a business school, always try and get into it. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so at this point, I will hand over to the hosts, Maxwell. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for having me. Yes, and, uh, yeah, I'm very, very grateful. Very, very brief. I think it, you've also heard it all from their end. And I think they are those who gave their feedbacks, they really learned a lot from this session. And I hope they still keep connect connecting with you if they need other help. And we also make adjustments with that. I think you didn't mention something to me about um what one-on-one -on -one kind of thing, but I don't know how it will be. So I'll, I'll talk to him and see how we'll be able to work on that as well. But uh, without wasting my time, I'll, I'll just have to say thank you very much for these three days. It's been very insightful and impactful. So that's all I have to say right now. So thank you very much, sir, for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Right. Thank you too. We are almost 
gone. So Gabriel just joined. We we are we are closing the door. <laughs> you have any <laughs> final word to say before we close the door? Okay. All right. So Marshall, I, I just want to thank you. And then I guess at this point I'll exit. Maybe if you have any meeting with your people, I'm sure you can go ahead with it. So thank you all for, for no. coming. Uh, please, sorry, before you leave, before you leave, Henry, uh, uh, when can we have uh, um another time with you so that oh. we can share? Uh, yeah. Yes. So, so um, you are free to have to take my should, number from, uh, from should prepare this, another date where we can again show you what we have done. So, um, with 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 his contact, um, I was actually I said it yesterday that I was supposed. To, Add him to the group, so I'm doing. I'll do it now so that you can all get access to him. And then, if you want to just call him, um, send him a okay. text or something. Can... Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. So if you call, I don't get just send me um WhatsApp. I would see, and then I will return to you. There's an eight hour time, you okay. can but um, I I'm I will, I'm happy. Yeah, thank you.